Hello there, everybody, and welcome to another series of ramblings and analysis. Anthony joining you once again, and as the title of this video implies, this is just going to be me rambling on or talking about whatever I feel like that's gaming related in the month of October. Now, I'm, or, I'm recording this on the 17th, and I've actually only recorded two things for this video. There's a third one I'm planning on doing right after I record this intro, but a little lackluster on news, so we'll see what happens. I'm not sure at this point when I'm recording this if the October 22nd um, thing that FFG is doing is going to be in here or another video. If it's in another video, you've likely already seen it by now, but if it's not, then it's in here. But enough with the rambling. Uh, I know for sure there are going to be at least four um, X-Wing articles, possibly only three. I'm not too sure on the dates on that one. There's going to be some Transformer stuff. And again, depending on things, we'll see what that big FFG news is on the 22nd. So I'm just going to cut it off here. Let's start the ramblings. Well, we're only seven days in, and it's been a while since there's been any news. But finally... Finally, something dropped that I actually want to talk about, the ETA 2 preview, finally. So, Wave 8, we're finally starting to get the preview, so my guess is next week is the V-Wing, then the week after that is the Tri-Fighter, and the week after that is going to be the um, Slave 1. But Tri-Fighter and V-Wing I'm definitely looking forward to, but let's see what the ETA 2 has to offer. So, looking at the dial, uh, one turns that are white, um... Two straights and banks are blue. Two turns are white. Two talon rolls are purple. So I'm not 100%. Well, actually, wait a minute here. I want to see something. Um, these purple maneuvers require the pilot to spend a force charge. Okay, so instead of gaining a strike, you'd have to spend a force charge. But yeah, that's actually a fairly decent thing if, um, if I do say so myself. So that's interesting to see. Uh, so that's definitely the first purple maneuver. Um, yeah, definitely the first purple maneuver, and I know Yoda's crew card out of the lat pack mentioned purple maneuvers, but this is the first time we're actually seeing it. Uh, anyways, back to the rest of the dial. Three straight and banks are blue, three turns are white, four straight is blue, four K turn is red, shocking, and then it has a five straight, so honestly, fairly standard dial for an interceptor style ship. You got all the fast maneuvers, you got some slower op you don't have too many slower options and you do have a couple of turnaround options but that purple talon roll is definitely interesting so um okay so purple maneuvers aren't without other benefits they do not incur stress this gives you the chance to reposition and line up a shot in the bullseye arc so like you could do a two talon roll and then wait boost without what the extreme maneuvers uh so it requires it's a force power that requires a boost capable small ship while you perform a boost action, you may spend a force charge to use the turn template instead. Okay, so if you, so you basically spent the here you spent two force charges and you just whipped around and got on this tri fighter. So, unfortunately, that's a circumstance you never want to see because tri fighters are awesome. No matter if they're leading a wing of clone troopers. Okay, so uh, this is a um, command upgrade. Oh, this is for epic. Okay, interesting. Uh, so, Jedi Commander, you're, while your wingmates execute purple maneuvers, they treat those maneuvers as red instead. While you defend... Okay, so... If I'm not mistaken, I don't have too many, too much experience with Epic, and I don't have any experience with Wings, but correct me if I'm wrong on this. The way Wings work is you set the leader's dial, and then everybody else does the maneuver based on the leader's position using the templates. So if you do some weird purple maneuver um, with the leader, then everybody else just uh, does that same maneuver, but they just treat it as red. Co quote me if I, correct me if I'm wrong on that, because again, I haven't too, had too much experience with Epic. Hopefully I'll get a chance to play some wing-based stuff with Cole some point in the future. Uh, now to the other ability, while you defend, and actually I should mention that just makes sense because most ships wouldn't have purple maneuvers. While you defend up to two of your wingmates in the attack arc may suffer a hit or crit to cancel, cancel a matching result. Um, I think this is something we saw on both Agent of the Empire and First Order Vanguard, so this is pretty standard. I think it was those two cards. Don't quote me on that. Uh, for pilots, uh, we saw this already, Anakin. After you are a friendly Obi-Wan ship at range 0 to 3, executes a maneuver. If there are more enemy ships than other friendly ships at range 0 to 1 of that ship, you may spend a force charge if you do that ship removes a red token of your choice so you have the ability to get stress or deplete or whatever off of obi-wan if you are willing to spend a force charge 
Going over the stat line though, three die bullseye arc primary, so this is similar to what we saw with the Nantex. Two die forward arc primary, three agility, three hull, three force charges, and then for the action bar you have focus, evade, red, or purple target lock, almost said red target lock, barrel, barrel roll, excuse me, boost, and then you have the intuitive controls ability. During the system phase you may perform a purple barrel roll or boost action. Um, I think, how is that different from fine-tuned controls? I gotta look this up, hold on. Oh, wait a minute, okay, so I'm looking at them side by side now. Fine-tuned controls is, triggers after you execute a maneuver. Intuitive controls triggers during the system phase. Okay, that makes sense, okay. So there's some differentiation there. This just also allows you to get some extra positioning beforehand, whereas fine-tuned controls is really meant for like arc dodging or stuff like that, so. There's that, and let's look at the Obi Wan. Uh, we kind of saw this coming from the product overview. After you are a friendly ship at range zero, or a friendly Anakin ship at range zero to three, executes a maneuver. If there are more enemy ships than other friendly ships at range zero to one of that ship, you may spend a force charge if you do that ship gains a focus token. Now, I sh now it does specifically mention Anakin and Obi Wan, but it's not specifically the ETA two versions. So Obi-Wan here could work with any of the four versions of Anakin, and Anakin could work with the Delta-7, so, or version of Obi-Wan, so. Oh, yet I pointed this out in the August Ramblings video. I honestly think it's hilarious that they include Anakin and Obi-Wan as pilots, but Obi-Wan, um, Obi-Wan, his art shows a bl his blue ETA-2, while the model is his red one. I just, I don't know why, I just find that hilarious, so. Obi-Wan and Anakin, back to this, they, they work well together. Not too sure if the, if the gaining focus tokens, removing stress tokens is necessarily the best thing ever for those guys, but hey, I guess it's something. So moving on, um, okay, so the Republic version of R2-D2, this was revealed, I think, in a live stream as well. Uh, Republic only astromech, two charges, and I should also mention that both Anakin and Obi-Wan have three force charges, but that's something we've come to expect at this point. Uh, R2, again, after you activate, you may spend a charge and gain a deplete token to repair a damage card, or recover a shield, or remove a device at range 0 to 1. So it offers you some options for healing, but you do have to take that attack penalty, and it also has the allows you to um, remove obstacles, so if you come dangerously close to a proximity mine, or if you have another ship in the path of said proximity mine, you can use this to remove it if you need it. That last one's going to be a very niche uh, situational um, piece. But the other two things are definitely going to make this card see play, assuming the cost isn't too high. So there's that. Uh, Ayla Sakura as a pilot, PS5, um, two force charges. While an enemy ship in your forward arc at range 0 to 1 performs an attack, the defender may change a blank to a focus result. Okay, that's always handy, you know, just focus tokens making them better. Not really much to say there, and it's a fairly decent ability. Now let's just hope that this version of Ayla isn't extremely overcosted like the lat crew member version was. Like, I'm still pissed about that. Uh, Patience, we've seen this card already. Um, still can't, haven't been able to figure. Oh wait, wait a minute, I forgot. Um, um, system or um, intuitive controls. Considering that ability requires you to spend a force charge during the system phase, you might actually have a reason to take this and you gain a deplete token to recover that force charge, so you reduce how much offensive firepower you're putting out, but you essentially have a chance to guarantee that that damage might actually do something in theory. So, I, I didn't like this card when it was first revealed and we didn't know what the ETA2's ability was, but now that we know what the ability is, I actually think this might be a fairly handy force power to take, specifically for the... Well, the Delta-7 could actually get away with it too in the same way, now that I think about it, so... That is interesting. I'm, I'm liking this card now, so there's that. Uh, Shakti, PS4. At the start of the end phase, you may spend any number of force charges to choose that many friendly ships at range 0 to 2, so you can only do up to 2. Each chosen ship does not remove a focus or evade token during the end phase, so if you want to stack some tokens, you can have this. And it's really going to, again, like a lot of things going to come down to the price point. We'll see how that goes, though. And you only get to choose up to fr two friendly ships. Like an Epic, if you're running this with a wing, Perhaps you can get away with that. Um, no, I just want to check here. Okay, so this is a command upgrade. Um, I'm a, you're probably going to end up using this on um, on um, Delta 7s and um, ARC 170s. Or not ARC 170s, what the heck am I saying? ETA 2s. So we'll see about that. And then Yoda, another version of the ship that's not in the pack, whatevs. 
After another friendly ship at rate zero to three spends one or more force charges, you may spend a force charge. If you do, that ship recovers a force charge. More force recovery options. Three charges on Yoda because duh. And uh, yeah, PS3 also, so interesting, I guess. Not really sure what else to say there. Um, Jedi General, so the generic is PS4 to force charges. I think the Jedi Knight for the Delta 7 had only one, so this is a definite upgrade. Plus, it's one higher pilot skill, so there's that. Uh, let's see, what else do we have here? Uh, the hyperdrives. Okay, so this is probably the inter most interesting thing out of this pack. So, let's read what this says. Uh, in addition to the pilots themselves, this pack includes several more ways to uh, make several of your Republic fighters even more versatile. Rather than rely on large carrier vessels, the, um, ships like the ETA-2... Um, Delta 7, a Delta 7 and the V-Wing make use of special hyperdrive rings to convey them on missions across the galaxy. These have some use in combat, giving pilots a greater degree, greater degree of freedom, I can speak, to choose where they begin to play. Beyond this, a ship equipped with one of these also possesses new ways to maneuver. The Transgalmeg control link assigns the ring, the dial, and initiative of the ship docked with it, while also transforming the way it moves. The link may severely limit the speed at which a ship travels, but it also gives them the ability to stop and rotate. Okay, so let's look at this. So, like it said, it gains the pilot skill of whoever, um, whoever is attached to it. Uh, so, you can either have a Delta 7 ETA-2 or a V-Wing dock with you. I'm assuming only the ETA-2 can actually fit in the actual model, but we'll have to see once we get our hands on it. Uh, while a ship is docked with you, you gain that ship's pilot skill and that is, are assigned that ship's dial. While you execute a maneuver, reduce its speed to one, so you have to move a heck of a lot slower. Before you execute an advanced maneuver, so either K-turns, sloops, or talon rolls, you can, you can execute a white stop maneuver instead, then rotate uh, 90 or 180. So, a white stop maneuver is interesting, so that's fun. Um, while no ship is docked with you, you are not assigned a maneuver dial and do not engage or activate. And it does have one agility, one hold, two shields. I'm assuming those are the stats for when it is not docked, but we're going to have to see what the interaction is in terms of this stat line, because if you're docked, does the regular ship take the damage? Does the, the um, hyperspace ring take the damage? But looking at the, um, at the, um, what is it? What is it? Um, what is this thing called? So this looks like it can only go on the hyperdrive ring. It took me forever to figure that out here. Um, I'm, I'm confused as to how this works. So I'm assuming, like, I, I'm because this is a new upgrade symbol. I'm not even sure how this works. So I think you might, like, attach it to the ship, and then you get the ring. I don't know, but it allows you, um, in terms of the ability, you can be placed anywhere in the play area beyond range one of any obstacles and beyond range three of enemy ships and the table edge. Honestly, I feel like this is going to be more for epic than anything. Whoa, okay. Okay, sorry about that. I just saw a dog scare off like eight turkeys, so uh, that happened. But anyways, um, so the hyperdrive ring, so you can uh, place any... So basically, it's probably going to be only good for epic because of how wide that play area is. For standard play, there's probably some limited areas where it's... Yeah, bleh, I cannot speak. Those turkeys, those mother turkeys. But um, there's probably going to be very few spaces where you could actually take advantage of this in standard. In epic, though... This could get interesting, especially if you're playing on a 6x3 instead of a 3x3. So, a little conjointed, or not conjointed, what the, what the, this, this jointed at the end there, but again, I'm not really too excited for this. I know Cole and Eric both are, so they're probably looking at this and are like hyped through the roof. So, again, next week, next week and the week after for the V-Wing and likely the Tri-Fighter are going to be what I'm looking forward to the most. So, we'll just have to wait and see, but the ETA-2 is a good way to start things off, so... And, and um, yeah, really, there's not much else to say here. It looks good. Can't wait for the V-Wing and the Tri-Fighter. Uh, let's see what happens next. Okay, so we have the V-Wing preview. Now, I originally had recorded this on the day it came out, which was the 15th, but the audio was just absolute trash. So here I am recording it again, and hopefully this one is a little more, co more coherent than usual. So I, I mentioned this in the previous clip, but... This and the Tri-Fighter are definitely the two ships I'm looking forward to the most. Definitely the Tri-Fighter more than the V-Wing, because I've been asking for the Tri-Fighter since Separatists first got leaked. 
back in, I think it was the summer of 20, it was August 2018, I believe, yeah. Because I remember sending Cole the picture of the prototypes for the um, Delta 7 and the Sith Infiltrator. So this, this the V-Wing I've also been asking for a lot, but the Tri-Fighter definitely more. So let's talk about the V-Wing though. So let's see here. So looking at the dial first, so we have a kind of a standard interceptor style dial. You've got white one turns, red one banks, all the two-speed maneuvers are blue except for the K-turn, which is red, which is not surprising to a non, um, a non, what is it, the, um, the tie defender, that's what it's called. And then the three speeds, the straight bank, uh, straight's blue, banks and turns are white, almost said yellow for whatever reason, I've been playing too much Among Us. Uh, four straight is white, four K-turn is red, five straight is white, again, standard interceptor dial, nothing fancy to mention there. Uh, with the f two generic pilots are the Loyalist Volunteer, which is PS2, and the Shadow Squadron Escorts. You can see that down there, and I believe PS3? Yes, so going over the basics of the V-Wing, two die forward primary, three agility, two hull, two shields, basically a Republic A-Wing. Uh, for actions, you have focus, target lock, evade, and then boost into a target lock, or not evade, tar focus, target lock, barrel roll, and boost into a target lock. Don't know why I said evade. Albeit, it doesn't even have the evade action, which for an interceptor is kind of surprising. But I'm not the devs. I don't know the reason. And I'm not going to get into that kind of speculation because, frankly, I am not qualified. But it also has the twin ion engines ability, which allows you to ignore tie ship restrictions on upgrade cards. Uh, we know of ion limiter override. That was the first one, I think, that had that restriction. But then there's another one in here that has it. But we'll get to that later. So... You have a PS2 generic, you have a PS3 generic, take your pick if you need a generic. Now for the two configurations, we've already seen Alpha 3B, which they revealed in the announcement stream for Wave 7.5 and Wave 8, which, while performing a primary attack, you can spend a lock you have on the defender to change a blank result to a, fo or a blank or a focus to a hit result. I mean, if you don't have a focus token and you only have one result left, I mean... Better to guarantee the change than re-roll it, so there's that. You also get a device slot. Not too sure how prevalent that will be, uh, but we'll see what happens. So the main thing here is, again, the target lock thing. But the more interesting of the two, at least in my opinion, is uh, Alpha 3E-esque, which it's two, it's two charges that are recurring. While you perform a primary attack, before rolling attack dice, you may spend two charges. So you only get this once every two rounds, essentially. If you do, your crits inflict ion tokens instead of damage. I love this. Now, one of my I love I love using ion cannons every once in a while, but my main gripe with them is you only get to do one damage, and honestly, sometimes ion tokens are wasted on like small ships. This gives you the option, if you want to, to activate ion tokens when you need them off of crits, and you still you basically don't have a damage cap, essentially. I mean you kind of still do, but it's not a hard cap like it is with like ion cannon or ion cannon turret, but more of a soft cap essentially. So, like with um, with um, the V wing, you're only going to be able to do um, one. Actually, wait a minute. I am really thinking about this here. Um, it's a primary attack, so at range one, it'll actually be really good because you can still do, you could do two damage in an ion token. At range two and beyond, not really going to be as prevalent. It basically just is an ion cannon where it can either do two ion tokens, two damage, or a um, or a um, ion token and a damage. So at least there's a little more variety in what you can do. And if you get damage, you get damage. And if you get ion tokens, you get ion tokens. So it isn't restricted in that regard. But not as good as I originally thought it was. I still like it, though. So... Yeah, um, I know I was a little incoherent there, but basically I'll sum that up for you. Range 3 is actually decent because you can do 2 damage with an ion token. Range 2 and beyond, you're either doing 2 damage, 2 ion tokens, or 1 damage and an ion token if you roll anything like that. But instead of it, you automatically getting a damage and an ion token with ion cannon, you at least have some flexibility in what comes out. So, yeah, that was a bit incoherent, but I, this is what happens when I start thinking about stuff on the fly in these videos. And again, these are more loosely edited, and it's me just rambling on, as implied by the title. Anyways, uh, Thermal Detonator. So these are making their return. Four charges, not recurring, as we do see with munitions, typically. During the system phase, you may spend up to two charges to drop that many Thermal Detonators using the one straight or two straight template. And each has to be placed using a different template. And when you reload that card, you recover an additional charge. So you recover two charges on a reload. And basically, this allows you to either conserve ammo and drop one, 
or if you need to essentially get a guaranteed shot or a guaranteed um, hit off and essentially turn these into frag grenades, you can drop two if you need to and cover a wider area. So I'm honestly liking this. The question is, what do the actual mines do themselves or the detonators or whatever you want to call them? Because this was the same question we saw with the concussion bombs from the HMP. And heck, I don't even remember what they do. Um, actually, I have the rule sheet right here in front of me because I got an HMP on day two. Um, concussion bomb. Uh, when this device detonates each ship at range uh, and remote at range 0 to 1 is dealt a face down damage card, then each ship must expose the damage card unless it gains a strain token. So that's what concussion bombs do. Thermal detonators, my guess is if it's anything like first edition, as it deals a damage and a stress. Maybe it deals a, um, di a disarm or, or not a disarm. What's, what's it? Uh, strain token, that's what it's called. I was thinking deplete, and then I thought disarm, and I meant strain. So that's interesting. So we've already mentioned uh, the two configurations. R7A7 is in this pack. Republic only astromech, three charges. While you perform an attack, you may spend a charge to change a hit to a crit. If you're using Esk and you roll two damage, you need an ion token. Or if you roll a damage and an ion or a damage and a crit, you need two ion tokens. There you go. Of course, it's always fun to change uh, hits to crits. So that's not to be underestimated either. So. Overall, I'd say it's a pretty decent astromech. Again, like a lot of things, we're going to have to see the points on this one, but if, hopefully they don't pull an Aayla Sakura and just, you know, jack this thing up unreasonably. So there's that. Um, let's see, what else was there? Ion Limiter Override. We've already seen this in the um, Thai um, Brute expansion, so I'm not going to cover that here. Oddball is on the V-Wing. Now, this is, I think, the fourth version of Oddball we've had because he was on the V-19, he was on the Arc-170, he was in the BTLB, and now he's in the V-Wing. But here's the thing. I think this version is actually good. The problem with the other three versions is that they were on very, very not maneuverable ships. The V-19 was the most maneuverable out of that bunch, and the BTLB and the Arc-170. If you call those maneuverable, you are legally insane. But regardless of that, um, having this on a much more maneuverable ship, an interceptor-style ship, is definitely going to allow him to take advantage more of the bullseye arc, which of course is needed in order to get the ability off. So that I am liking. Um, compared to, I think, I think I actually harped on um, Oddball being on the BTLB when I did the analysis of that pack back in like before the pandemic and before I started doing gameplay videos. So that's fun. Uh, Precision Ion Engines. Here's the other tie only card that I mentioned, but it has to go on an Agility Three tie ship. So don't think about putting it on. I think. Let's see, the TIE Punisher, the Reaper, I don't think the Striker is Agility 3. I'm not sure about the Aggressor, I think that's 2, but regardless, um, it's 2 charges, so you only get 2 uses per game, it's not recurring. But before you execute a 1 to 3 speed K turn, you may spend a charge to execute that as a sloop instead. Really, it's just for, if you need a slightly different position, you can use it, so it is one of those things where it's better to have it, not need it, than need it, not have it, if you have the points, so... If you got a few points to kill and you don't feel the need to take an initiative bid, there's this if you're using V-Wings or Ties with Agility 3, so there's that. Uh, Q7 Astromech, Republic-only Astromech. While you barrel roll or boost, you can move through or overlap obstacles. Overlapping is not going to be too prevalent, but moving through for smaller smaller um, obstacles definitely going to be helpful if you're lying, trying to line up a specific shot. So this is probably going to cost about 3 or 4 points if you ask me, so... At that price point, I think it would be good. Any more than that, it could be, be um, kind of un not worth it. So there's that. And then the other three pilots, uh, Contrail PS5, while you defend or perform an attack, if the bearing of your revealed maneuver is the same as the enemy ship's, you may change one of the enemy ship's focuses to a blank. It's nice. It, I mean, it's a nice ability, but it's not going to like be super impactful. It's one of those where like it'll, it'll happen pretty frequently, or actually not too frequently. And it's nice when you get it, but it's not going to be completely game-breaking. And what it means by bearing, for those of you who are pulling a blank right now, is if if um, Contrail reveals a straight and the um, ship other ship involved in, in the attack involving Contrail revealed a straight, then the bearings were the same. So the bearing is like straight, bank, turn, K-turn, sloop, talon roll, that stuff. Excuse me. So um, there's that. Tarkin... Uh, we, this was another card that was revealed in the announcement stream. So during the system phase, you may choose an object you have locked at range 1 to 3. Another friendly ship at range 1 to 3 may acquire a lock on that object. Not necessarily good for munitions, but for other V-Wings using uh, um, bet, 3B Besh, this is going to be extremely helpful in assuring those target locks actually stay floating. And then this next thing I'm going to talk about, it's something that me and Cole have discussed doing as, as um, part of a Christmas video that we're planning, but... 
If you play with, basically you can use any ship from any faction, so you could have like a First Order and a Rebel ship. Tarkin with HMPs is going to be nuts. So that only applies if you're playing no faction restrictions, so like you can mix factions all you want. Other than that, it's mainly going to be used for 3B B-Wings, or almost said B-Wings, this isn't Rebels, V-Wings, there we go. And then this pilot, Click, this is going to easily be the best pilot in the expansion, I'm calling it now, no question. While a ship that you have locked at range 1 to 3 performs a, or defensive performs an attack, it's not a, just a primary attack, it's any attack, you may spend a, um, a charge to prevent range bonuses from being applied. Now, the range bonuses thing isn't going to matter if they're using like torpedoes or missiles, but if they're using cannons or turrets, this could be handy. Um, not sure why you would want to lock a friendly ship for this, because that would negate their range bonuses. But you lock an enemy ship, you have this Tarkin and maybe a couple other ships, you have you have the um, you can use the lock for 3D bash, you can use it for this. And I've talked about this before with sync laser cannon, but denying range bonuses is huge. So if if you're really close to an enemy ship firing on you, you can deny them their range one bonus. If they're super far away, you can deny them their range three bonus. Like it's such a simple ability. But the power it allows you to have is immense and cannot be underestimated. So I am really loving this. And um, it's only once per turn, in case I didn't already mention that. But that is going to be fun. So um, again, a lot more, a little more coherent than usual. I still had that bit with um, at with 3E that I kind of rambled on because I didn't realize something. But whatever. This is still looking fun. But next week, oh, next week. Tri Fighter probably next week. That is going to be fun, so moving on to the next thing. Okay, so let's talk about some Transformers. Now, I talked, I think, in the August ramblings about the first set out of, from the Ark, and I'm not sure if I've mentioned it here, um, there's also uh, a group, the Alpha Trion Protocols, which is managed by Vector Sigma and I think a few other groups or individuals and they're creating some stratagems and they're actually working on their second wave right about now so there's a couple of these going on and there's likely more that i haven't heard of so if you know of any that you want me to talk about let me know in the comments and i'll do a little bit of digging to see if it's something that i think is worth talking about but today we're talking about the first wave from bayformers world strike now bayformers it's unfortunately not the michael bay um transformers stuff the Bay part of their name just comes from the fact that they're based in San Francisco, I think their Facebook description said. I'm not sure. I'll, I'll put a link in the description to their Facebook page if you want to go check them out. But what they are doing with World Strike now, um, currently at the time I'm recording this, it's in a public beta stage. So they're asking the community to test out their um, beta versions of certain cards in order to try to figure out issues with the cards or rules, um, rules questions or possibly breaking the cards. In fact, the first phase is what they've dubbed are the most problematic and have the potential to be broken cards. And actually, the day I'm recording this, me and John had just recorded the um, Omega Supreme versus um, Prime and Crew video that you might likely have seen from a couple of weeks ago. So that um, so we're already doing some extensive testing into turn um, turnabout snare. Um, um, countdown and what else was it? Oh yeah, last line of defense. So those are three of the new cards in there. So again, they're doing the public beta. Each thing last is going to last about a week. I'm not sure if it'll still be going when this video goes up on November 1st, so I'm not going to talk about that. But what I do want to talk about is the contents of the set. So I am just trying to find this one thing here. Where is it? Aha, uh -huh, here it is. So the set contents. So we know they're going to contain 30 characters, 36 stratagems, and 63 battle cards. So, it's, it's a pretty large set, because I think the arc, if I'm not mistaken, had 38 characters, 20 stratagems, and I believe 40 battle cards? I am actually looking at, yeah, 40 battle cards, 20 stratagems, 38 characters. So, a little less on the characters and the, um... Uh, a little less on the characters, but more on the stratagems and the battle cards. So, I think this is a fairly balanced set in terms of, um how many um, cards are in it so and also the fact that it has a proper name is nice like it just gives more authenticity to it which is always a good thing so yeah that's the set contents in terms of some of the main features of the set the big one is we are getting quintessons so currently we only have at the time i'm recording this we only have uh three of them or four of them revealed those being um, deliberata i think it's pronounced i'm trying to pull it up right here and there is some some issues happening 
I think it's the Liberata. I might go try to find it somewhere else. But there's also going to be Gnaw and then two generic Sharpticons in the form of Biter and Chomp. So we're getting so we're getting Sharpticons as well in this. We're actually getting it in Arc 2, but let's focus on World Strike here. Yeah, Deliber Deliberata? Deliberata? Deli How do you pronounce that? I don't know. I'll have images on the screen, most likely, of these. So Deliberata um, is one of the Quintesson judges. There are certain cards that interact with that. And then, we, of course, we have the Sharkticons. There are certain cards that interact with that. And there are also Micromaster cards, so that's fun. And um, there's also um, some battle cards that interact specifically with those Sharkticons. And if, there's actually also Alicons, so we're getting Alligator uh, Decepticons as uh, most likely Quintesson, since a lot of those cards seem to be Quintesson battle cards. So that's fun. Uh, but we're not just getting Quintesson stuff. We are getting some generic support. Uh, I've already talked about Autobot Countdown, and you've seen me use the beta version on the channel. Uh, we're getting Armada, which is interesting because he's both a Decepticon and it looks like a Unicronian. Uh, they haven't officially announced what that faction, what the that light brownish yellow faction is. I'm assuming based off the Unicron card that we got in the Arc Unicron raid set, I'm assuming that's Unicronian. I'm not 100% sure. We'll see what happens. And then also, um, there's a uh, Triple Changer Battle Master. So, uh, Shock Blast, he's a four cost Battle Master. He has a bot mode, an ult mode, and a weapon mode. So, that's kind of cool to see. Um, so, those are some of like the, like, again, the main focus is the Quintessons. But of course, there are some other support pieces. Like, um, if you look in the Stratagems, of course, there's Last Line of Defense for Omega Supreme, which I've actually started to isolate an issue on that card. So, um, I'm going to do a bit more testing with that and we'll see where that goes. But again, there's support for the Quintessons, there's some support for, um, other, for um, existing stuff, and of course there's some generic battle cards. Um, there's uh, actually some that actually are both generic and right, uh, Quintesson exclusive, like uh, Aquatic Maneuvers, which works with Quintessons or Boats, which I think is actually the first boat support that we've had. So yeah, there's definitely some interesting stuff in here, and again, right now, they're, uh, at the time I'm recording this, they're showing off all the broken stuff. So people are testing that probably a lot. Hopefully they get some good information so they can balance these out and make sure that the set um, doesn't have cards that are just completely bust the format open for any tournaments that allow Bayformer cards. Um, yeah, also I should mention, like, if you're, um, if you're participating in this, don't test it with ARC cards or Alpha Triumph cards or any other group's cards. Because, in my opinion, it's a bad idea to test, like, independent, uh, two different groups' cards with each other because they weren't designed with each other in mind, and that could lead to breaking the game in unintended ways. So, I would not recommend doing that, but then again, that's just my opinion. You're free to do whatever you want. But when you're, te uh, at least when you're playing just casually with your friends, when testing and maybe doing competitively, stick to one set. Like, again, that's just my opinion, but you can argue with me on that one in the comments all you want, as long as you're respectful about it. So... Looking at the stuff that we know for uh, World Strike, I'm really liking it. We're getting a new faction. We're getting two new factions. We're getting some support for some cards that I feel like have been left out for sure, and we're getting some pretty interesting battle card effects. So, yeah, I'm actually I'm really liking this so far. Like when I saw like the arc when that first came out, I was like, ooh, new content, and now I'm seeing like the community just coming together, like even if it's in independent groups to create new cards and just keep the game alive. That's just amazing to see because. This, again, this was one of my favorite games, and it was just, it was such a disappointment to see it get canceled so early, but it's good to see the fan base is doing everything they can to ensure that this game keeps going. So, yeah, that's my little two cents about World Strike. I'm not sure if I'm going to add any more on later in this video. Um, we'll see what happens depending on other, car other cards getting revealed. Um, probably not, though. So, anyways, moving on to the next thing. Okay, I can, I'm going to admit, I, com I was so hyped up for the news that's coming tomorrow that I completely forgot that the Tri-Fighter preview was going to go up today. So, uh, yeah, we have the Tri-Fighter preview. I've mentioned this before, like, at least 15 times. This is the ship I'm looking forward to the most. I'm excited for the V-Wing, and I'm sort of excited for the ETA-2 and the Slave-1, the Separatist version. But the Tri-Fighter, we're finally getting it, and I am so f***ing hyped. Let's go. So... Hopefully, hopefully it meets my expectations. I'm, if I start geeking out like a like some tryhard twelve year old about Fortnite or whatever, we'll see what happens. Um, it made no sense. Whatever.
look, my, my mind is all over the place right now because I'm just so excited because we have this today, then we have the big announcement tomorrow, and then next week we have ArcWave 1 fo getting fully dropped, and oh my god, I am just so f***ing hyped right now. My mind is all over the place. So, looking at the dial, so... One turns are white, one talon rolls! Ooh, I think that's the first time we've had a one talon roll on a ship, so, uh, there's that. Uh, in terms of the two-speed maneuvers, straight and turns are blue, banks are white. This is something we've seen out of droids where the turns are generally easier for them than the banks. Same situation with the three speeds, so the banks are, are white and the straight and turns are blue. We also have a 3k turn, a four straight that's blue, and a five straight that is white. Curiously, the five, why is the five straight white? I'm pretty sure this thing was faster than an A-Wing, and I'm pretty sure the A-Wing has a blue five straight, if, if I'm not mistaken. So I'm not too sure why they did that. Maybe it was for balancing reasons. It probably was for balancing reasons, but considering I think the A-Wing does have a five straight that's blue, it's just a little confusing to me. But overall, I'm fairly happy with the dial, especially the one talent roll. Okay, so intercept booster. This is what I've been wanting to see for a while now. So... We've seen the attach side before. Equip this side face up. During the system phase, gain a disarm token unless you flip this card. At the end of the end phase, if you have no active charges, you have to flip it. And it's three down, it's um, three um, decreasing charges, and you get the slam into a link target lock as a configuration. Now, the down, the um, decreasing can charge thing, it makes sense. At the During the end phase of each turn, you lose a charge. So you can only have this on you for a max of three turns, or less if you decide to, um, if you decide not to take the disarm token, which there are going to be situations that you want to do that if you need to engage early. But kind of what I want to do with this is just use it to sh um, five straight, then slam another five straight. And I just actually noticed that it has a 5k turn. Okay, I missed that. So you five straight, then you so um, do another five straight. I think you're allowed to do that. And then just swing around your opponent and then just nail him from behind. So that could be fun. And especially if the Tri-Fighter has a cannon slot with auto blasters, that is going to be amazing. And once the intercept booster is detached, you don't have uh, anything. So hopefully this is only like two or three points. If it's any more than that, um, it's probably going to end up in a weird situation like with what Grappling Struts had to go through when it was first released. So uh, yeah, there's that. Um, so there's that. Uh, Separatist Interceptors, uh, PS3 version uh generic let's take a look at the abilities of course it has network calculations that we've seen on the vulture droid and the hyena uh three die primary Ooh, that's good uh so three die three primary attack three agility three holts basically a tie interceptor in the stat line for actions you have calculate folk or calculate evade target lock barrel roll into a red evade and then boost into a red calculate so a fairly decent upgrade suite and of course it does offer some options for action economy if you want to get into red action so that is looking good. Uh, Discord missiles, we have seen these before. It looks like that is not loading. Buzz droid swarm, same thing. Is my internet deciding not to cooperate? Is it seriously deciding not to cooperate now? Okay, I guess they just don't have the picture of those um, of those cards. But we've seen them before, so nothing too special. Oh, are you kidding me? Is it seriously going to do this to me? Yep, establishing secure connection. God damn it. Um... Yeah, give me a minute while this loads. Okay, there we go. Things are finally starting to load again. So, Discord missiles, buzz droids, we've already seen these. XX23S Thread Tracer. Now, this is making its return from first edition. Um, you can only have two in your list, though. So, there's that because of these little dot things here. We've seen this with Separatists and pretty much every, like, yeah, we've pretty much seen this with Separatists for a while now. And also, I think Republic to an extent, but don't quote me on that. It's a missile upgrade. Range 1 to 3, 3 die attack, it's munitions, so you don't get any range bonuses, 2 charges, uh, it has an attack qualification, you need to either be focusing, calculating, or have a target lock, and you spend a charge, and if the attack hits, each friendly ship at range 1 to 3 of the defender may acquire a lock on the defender, then cancel all dice results. Now, there's a couple of things in first order that I think would be able to take advantage of this, and also for separatists, HMPs. Just slap one of these on an HMP, um, and then you'll be, or like on a hyena or something, and then everybody can lock it, and the network game is just absolutely insane. So, uh, so First Order and Separatists, I think, are going to be the ones that really enjoy this the most, especially just basically for the reasons I said, because there's a couple of First Order pilots that love having their locks, like Omega Ace and Lieutenant LaHughes, but then also for Separatists, you have the HMP with network game, so 
that's fun. And I am that I'm definitely gonna be trying that out. And I am definitely getting multiple tri fighters, no questions asked. It's already starting it's already meet my expectations. So DIS three four seven target acquired. At the start of the engagement phase, you may acquire a lock on an object that at range one to three that has a friendly lock on it. Again, HMPs. I am, okay, this has already met my expectations. Like, whoo, this is, this is looking amazing. Like, the Tri-Fighter, I'm just seeing this, and like, I, I'm still in the mindset of like trying to figure out the HMP, and I'm just seeing all of this, and I'm like, this will work so well with the HMP. Like, oh my god, yes. Um, it says right here, making it the ideal partner to pair with a group of HMP um, gunships and the perfect candidate. Wait, does it have the system slot? Because it talks about upgrading, looks like the Tri-Fighter with a fire control system. Because it says here, uh, making it the ideal partner for a group of HMPs and the perfect candidate to be upgraded with a fire control. So does this thing actually have, um, if this thing has a system slot, holy crap. Okay, then we have the FLAC RFOC prototype, I think that's how you pronounce it. Okay, so this is a PS, whoa, a PS5 generic, whoa, okay. Uh, during the system phase, you may spend your lock on a ship to look at that ship's... Did they design this thing intentionally to work super freaking well with the HMP? Like, um, I know you have to spend your lock, but, uh, yeah, like, did you, did they, I'm pretty sure they designed this with the HMP in mind, so, uh, yeah. Now, in terms of the actual ability, I mean, maybe it'll be helpful if you have an intercept booster attached, just so that way you can plan out your slamming a little better, but... Then again, this is going to be moving after most ships, so that's really not too helpful. It's really only going to be handy if you're trying to figure out how to... Maybe if you're trying to block a PS6 or something like that, but if you're going to be using a, a blocker, why not just go for the, one of the lower-cost generics, or heck, use a Vulture Droid for that. So, a little confused on that one, but there's prob somebody's going to figure something out. We always figure something out, except with Jamming Beam. That card just sucks. <laughs> Um, and then let's see here, a Marg Sab or Marg Sable closure. I think that's how you pronounce it. It's an EPT for smaller medium ships. After you fully execute maneuver, if you move through an obstacle structure or a huge ship, it, or if you deployed, you may choose an enemy ship in your front arc at range one to two. That ship gains a strain token, so you have a way to dish out strain tokens. And this really the only time this is going to be relevant in standard is if you overlap an obstacle. I mean, also, this could be relevant if you're, like, deploying a sheathapede with a ghost, and I think I, me and Cole actually talked about doing this at some point. I don't remember what the conversation was. All we were talking about, no, I was talking about was, like, having the ghost come forward, and if, like, a tri-fighter ends up behind you, you can just deploy your shuttle from the ghost and then use this to deal strain tokens, so that way it's a little easier for other things to hit it later on, so... This definitely has its uses, and dish dishing out strain tokens is always beneficial. You have to move through an obstacle, though, which is a slight problem. But, again, we'll, people will figure something out. The deployment thing is definitely the easiest to work with, in my opinion. And maybe, like, a TIE Swarm on a Gazanti would be fun with this. So we'll have to see how that plays out. So I know I'm going to try to get, like, four copies of this and then just put them on TIE Fighters and then an Epic just deploy them from a Gazanti, because that could be fun. Um... Okay, Fearsome Predator. So this is the um, um, Limit 3 gener or generic. So PS3. After placing forces, assign the Fearful Prey condition to an enemy ship. Now what the heck does this do? Um, fearful pre Prey. After you defend against an enemy Fearsome Predator, if you did not spend at least one green token during the attack, gain a strain token. Okay, so more strain dealing effects. So, you, I mean... Yeah, what 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 is there to say? Like this, just dealing out strain tokens is fairly handy. I mean, it, you, it's at PS3, so there's a chance it might not be too relevant. But if you're running enough vulture droids, or like if you're running Geonosian prototype HMPs, it will actually make a difference. So, in that context, I kind of like it, just as a way to you know make your HMPs a little more effective. And yes, I am loving the HMPs in case you haven't noticed. But we're focusing on the Tri-Fighter. Uh, let's see here. DIS T81. I think we've seen this. I'm not sure, though. It's PS4 unique. While you defend or perform an attack, you may spend a calculate token from the uh, friendly ship in the enemy ship's firing arc to change a focus to a, either an evade or a hit result. So basically, you can double down on network calculations in a way. Not too sure how useful that would be unless you have Kraken on the field. If you have Kraken on the field, you can kind of get away with it a little more, but... 
honestly, I, I like it, but I don't think it's anywhere near as good as the other Unique. And also, um, yeah, this is easily... This is, um, DIS-347 three, is definitely the best pilot in the expansion, and then Fearsome Predator coming in at number two. So, at least that's how I view it. I'm Actually, it may be the other way around, because Fearsome Predator can kind of operate with really anything in Separatists, while DIS really kind of needs HMPs to shine. So, it's really, you could kind of argue back and forth on which one is better, but I'll, I'll leave that to you, for you to do in the comments section, respectfully, as always. And then finally, Independent Calculations. Uh, you have to have the network calculations ability, so this can only go on vultures, hyenas, and tri-fighters. Standardized? What the heck is that? Um, okay, so it's a modification. Replaced your network calculation ship ability with the following. Oh, so it replaces your ship ability. That's interesting. While you perform a white calculate action, you may treat it as red to gain in a calculate token. Other ships cannot spend your calculate tokens using network calculations. Okay, so, um, yeah, so if you put this on other ships, and then you have DIS uh, T81, you can use those other ships to move calculate tokens onto him, it's just they can't spend yours, or you can't spend theirs more accurately. Um, wait, hold on, I, I gotta read this here, give me a moment. Okay, so, like, if you have one ship with this, then you can use the, um, um, I think it's uh, T81 in order to um, gain, like, you know, make, take full advantage of his ability. But then um, other ships can't use your calculate token. So essentially DIS is a way, or um, T81 is a way to um, kind of work around the restriction of you can't use, um, use, you can't use network calculations to steal calculate tokens from a ship with independent calculations. Now, do I think this is the best thing for separatists? No, there's definitely still separatist lists that are gonna want to play under that in the, or that with the network calculation stuff. But and there are going to probably be some lists maybe in the future that use like Slave One and Sith Infiltrator, where you have one like hyena with um a whole bunch of munitions or an H or not an HMP with a whole bunch of munitions, probably a hyena with a whole bunch of munitions. And since you don't have any other ships. You know, you can just throw this on there. Now, what does the standardize... Wait, okay. Rather than modify a single ship, this upgrade is standardized to, across all ships of the same type in a squadron, meaning that all ships are requiring all ships of that type to be equipped with a copy. Whoa, okay. So, uh, if you take one, you have to take them all on every ship in your squadron. Now... And again, if you were only running one copy of a ship like a hyena, like I just mentioned, that's not going to matter. But if you're running like four vulture droids and you slap this on one of them, they're all going to be stuck on their lonesome, which probably isn't going to be that good. But in the case of, I, I think the best use for this is probably going to be tri-fighters and hyenas. Tri-fighters, just because they are a little more independent because of how fast they're moving, they're more likely to stay away from other friendly ships. But meanwhile, hyenas, they do want as much modification on themselves as possible because they're usually carrying a decent amount of munitions, except for that one that has, like, the jam action. I don't remember what that one's called, though. But overall, I said at the beginning, I was hoping this lived up to my expectations, and oh my god, did it. Like, it's right at my expectations, if not above. And this is like, oh my, I, I can't even put into words how excited I am now for this. Like, I was already pretty excited before. But now, like, I'm looking at this and I'm like, oh my god, can it please be November 27th already? Because I'm pretty sure that's actually the last Friday of the month. So, let me actually take a look here. Okay, yeah, it's the last Friday of the month. So, basically, we start off the Christmas season or the holiday season or whatever holiday you celebrate. We start off that season by, you know getting this, getting this magnificent piece of machinery for X-Wing. So that's a pretty good way to start off the holiday season, if you ask me. So I'm just going to shut up now, and I'm not sure if the next segment is going to be whatever happens tomorrow or if it's going to be something else, because I'm still not sure how long that segment is going to take. Depending on how long it is, I may just move it into its own video, or depending on how hyped I get, we'll see what happens. But regardless, on to the next thing. Well, people, the day is finally here, and I called it. Like, I mean, it was fairly obvious what this reveal today was going to be, but it finally happened. We were getting a new version of this. Oh, are you kidding me? It's 175 bucks? Are you kidding me? This... 
I'm still excited for it, but oh my god. Like, I mean, I knew it was going to be over 100, but that? We better be getting a lot of stuff in this. I mean, we probably are. I was watching the live stream earlier, and uh, there seems to be quite a bit of stuff in here. So hopefully, once we um, start to see what's fully in it, that'll become a, um, the price will become a bit more justified. But still, it's 175 that's just ridiculous. Like, not ridiculous, in, it's bad. It's just ridiculous in terms of the height of, like, the absurdity of the price. Well, maybe not absurdity, but just the, the, the volume of the price, essentially. I don't even know how to describe it. Like, again, it's the Tri-Fighter yesterday, this today, and then some art cards being revealed here or there. My mind is kind of fried right now. So, um, okay, something about the Uthuk. Okay, that's interesting. Okay, so this, okay, so the big thing about this compared to Journeys in the Dark is that it's co-op only. There's no Overlord. It's not one versus many. It's strictly co-op, and because of that, they've been able to engineer the app slightly differently from the Road to Legend app for second edition. At least that's what they were saying on the live stream. We'll see how that actually pans out, but it should be interesting to see how it does pan out because... They're saying it's their most of advanced app ever, and they're able to do some really weird stuff with it, like having the game remember certain things, or having like enemies of the same like enemy type like be different from each other, which is going to be interesting. So let's take a look here. So the big question: Legends of the is Legends of the Dark third edition of Descent? No, it is not. I was a little disappointed at first, right when I heard that, but we'll see how this plays out because honestly, like. I'm I, anything Descent, I'll 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 be excited for because Descent is awesome. Like if you haven't played um, Second Edition, or heck, if you haven't even played First Edition, it's a fun game. And in fact, while I was watching the live stream, I was painting a couple of plague or one of the plague worms from uh, the Trollfins expansion. Since I managed to get that cheap on Amazon, but regardless, back to the thing at hand. So they meant to talk about it. Although Journeys in the Dark featured Road to Legend, that game was always designed as a competitive experience. Legends of the Dark harnesses its integrated companion app to deliver a cooperative game from the very from the very beginning. And here we can see some of the stuff that's included. It looks like they have dedicated lava tiles for terrain, 3D terrain. This is kind of cool. Just you know, having like that more. This is they just again they're pushing this as a very narrative driven experience, something akin to like D and D or Edge of the Empire. So having that 3D terrain, I feel like helps in like get the players to embrace their roles a bit more and like immerse them better. So that was a great call on their part, and that also is part of the reason probably for the uptick in price because Descent Second Edition did have a couple of things that were like 3D, but it was like doors and brush and stuff like that, and there never was anything like truly 3D like this is true 3D, and it, I mean, it, it justifies the price jump from like 80 bucks to 175 to an extent. But apparently there's also a bunch of content in here, so we'll, we'll keep going from that. So we have some examples of tiles. We have some weapons. We have a couple of skills. We um, have some equipment, it looks like, and then a couple of figures here. Of course, like second edition, it looks like that the um, heroes are going to be in gray plastic. The monsters are going to be only in tan plastic. It looks like the minion master thing is being eliminated to an extent. Uh, you'll notice this little colored chip at the bottom of the... Um, of the um, model, and I, they mentioned this in the live stream, but these are colorblind friendly because they have these little markings, like these little indents in the chip, so that way you can tell certain things apart. So that's a good move on their part. So core gameplay mechanics such as combat fatigue, skill items have received completely new interpretations, while a new approach to scenario laid out in 3D terrain creates striking multi-level scenarios. And when they say multi-level, they mean multi-level. There are actual like stairs, like. 3D stairs that you could walk up, and there were like different actual floors for, you know, quests and stuff like that. Which when I saw that, my mind was blown because like, just the amount of effort it must have taken to figure that stuff out. So, because of these various differences, Descent and Legends of the Dark is not compatible with Journeys in the Dark content. But then again, that's probably not going to stop some hardcore fans from trying to incorporate that stuff into the game. And depending on how complex the systems are for Legends of the Dark, I might be one of those. So, okay, so we have, looks like, the six heroes. So, Cyrus, Brynn, Galadin, Chance, Varix, and Kelly? Keely? I don't know how you pronounce that. Like, correct me if I'm mispronouncing any of these. So, you're getting six heroes in the core set compared to second edition's eight. So, you're um, a little more limited on your hero choices, but I think they've designed it so that way there's a multitude of different ways you can go with them. So, in that respect, it's actually fairly decent. So, yeah, um, oh, and there, I just realized one of them's a dragon. 
Which one of them said, oh, that one's a dragon. Oh, that's cool. And also, can I just talk about, like, they, they're saying, like, these are some of the most advanced miniatures they've ever made. And looking at the renders, I can definitely see that. These are going to be an absolute, oh, is that a phoenix? Is that a little baby phoenix? Oh, my, oh, my God. These are going to be an absolute blast to paint. So, um, dragon hybrid outcast. Okay, so... Looks like, let's see here, so we have an elf, we have a couple of humans, we have a dwarf it looks like, too. Uh, I'm not sure. Um, yeah, dwarf and artificer or something like that. Some like cat ninja thing, I don't know what those are called. I'm not too familiar with like D&D style fantasy realms, like that kind of species, but then we also have the dragon hybrid. So they're definitely increasing the variety of the species amongst the heroes, so that's definitely cool to see. Cause with second descent with journeys in the dark like a lot of the heroes were human and you really didn't see much variety outside of the occasional like orc or i think like yeah like the occasional orc or something like that but it's good to see that they're starting to or the occasional elf as well but it's good to see they're branching out so uh yeah ffg sculpted miniatures are pushed to new heights like this is like something they could probably not get away with with their old style of plastic so and i think they've been pushing for hard plastic recently with legion so it's good to see that they're pushing that into other areas of their industry so um or other products i should say so that's interesting gameplay is fast and intuitive you take three actions every turn one maneuver and two additional actions okay so if, uh, like, if you're not familiar with second edition, how the action system in that worked was that you got two actions and one of those options was a movement action, which did, which while the system worked and it was decent, one problem was that sometimes you'd have to waste burn an action on movement and uh, that could lead to some situations where you get put in a compromising position against enemy monsters or enemy figures. Having the act movement like guaranteed to you at during each of your turns definitely helps to open up what you're able to do on your turn and allows the game to not only be sped up to an extent, but also just allows for a bit more action, which so that's a good call. And I mean, we kind of had this in second edition already with um, Okaluk and Rakash, who automatically gained four movement points that they could just spend whenever they felt like on their turn. So they're pushing that to every hero, and I think that's a great call on their part. Again, just to help keep the action moving in the game instead of just having heroes stall out for a turn, essentially. Um, other than maneuvering, you can use an action to attack an enemy, um, or you can use explore actions to interact with terrain or tokens using the app. Uh, you can perform the one of the most crucial actions, the ready action. Okay, so kind of how readying worked in second edition was there kind of like, there were kind of like two different versions of it. Either you um, automatically readied like certain weapons or cars at the end of your turn or at the start of your turn, or you got to um, perform a rest action to recover all your stamina points. Uh, they've kind of merged that into into the same thing here because. As you use certain abilities, you take fatigue like you did with 2nd edition, but how the um, ready action works is you remove all fatigue tokens from your um, card that you're using, um, that you're resting, and then you flip the card. So it looks like all the cards are double-sided, so you can kind of switch back and forth between different abilities during the game, which if you play Transformers, that's very much what this is like. So. As somebody who does play Transformers pretty regularly, it's kind of cool to see them using this mechanic as a way to, you know, just kind of represent, um, like, the heroes in different, like, states of the game or of their quests. So that's a pretty cool addition, if you ask me. And they're also doing this with, like, skills, and they're doing this with weapons, which is really interesting. So we'll get to that in a moment. So, and there's also limits um, on the fatigue. So like the stamina stat in 2nd edition, you can only take certain amounts of fatigue, and once you get to that point, you can't use the... Um, um, ability on that card anymore so like this one requires you to gain three and once you use it you have to um recover and then flip over so it's going to be a while before you're able to use it now the question i have is can you take the same action multiple times in a turn and also can you take it can you give up one of your actions for extra movement that those are two questions i have just because like sometimes you do need to like hightail it so you need that second movement that um, second edition offered like you could just spend both your actions on movement and there are going to be some turns where you might want to ready twice in order to cl effectively clear a thing without going to another ability because going to the other ability might be unfavorable in that situation so those are a couple of questions i still have but we'll see how that goes and it looks like they're um in terms of the um sheets they're bringing back uh let's see so they have the speed they have the health they have the attack and defense dice, um, just like, um, actually the attack dice is new. So like, 
in second edition or in Journeys of the Dark, and you keep saying second edition, I need to reference specifically Journeys in the Dark. Like the weapons had the attack dice that you got to use, they weren't automatically printed on the hero sheet, so that's a change. But the defense dice on the hero sheet stays the same. There might be some like armors that give you extra defense dice, but we'll see how that goes. You have your ability, you have your surge ability, so instead of surge abilities being on the weapons it looks like, uh, all heroes have like a base surge ability they have access to. This armor thing at the bottom, I don't know what that is. You have the fatigue limit, and then you also have your um, characteristics or stats. I'm not sure how these were compared to second edition. I'm not going to com comment on that until I learn more. And then of course you have your health. So looking back up here, it actually looks like they've dropped the health threshold, because a lot of heroes in second edition, or in Journeys in the Dark, were hovering around like 10 to 12 health. But now a lot of them seem to be hovering around 8 to 9 health, except for Bryn and uh, Cyrus, who hover at who are at 10 and 7. So it's going to be interesting to see where kind of the health average lies in this. So um, this is talking about fatigue. Your hero sheet is the only thing you can ready. Every hero also has an attack card and skill cards. Each hero starts the game with two weapons cards sleeved together. Sleeves are... Um, so you... Okay, so I'm, I'm kind of rambling on again here. But every hero, it looks like, starts with two weapons. And you sleeve them together, so they're essentially a double-sided card, based kind of like how the Transformers cards work. So, basically, like, how you ready these is when you attack with them, it looks like you take fatigue or something, or the fatigue goes on the card, so you can only use it a certain number of times, and when you ready the weapon, you flip it over to its other side. And I'm, it sounds like you can ready cards without them having any fatigue on it. So you can flip your cards kind of in when you absolutely need to. So if you need to switch from like a melee weapon to a ranged weapon, you can. So looking at these two weapons that they provide, and is this seriously going to do it? Okay, so yeah, it looks like weapons have their own surge ability. So like this Iron Thorn War Bell, or actually let's talk about the spear. So... During your attack, uh, add three stars and enfeeble the enemy. Okay, wait a minute. Hold on. Were there two different sides to that? Were there two different sides to that? Hold on. I want to um, take a look here. Add two and enfeeble the enemy. Add three and enfeeble the enemy. Wait a minute. Hold on. Can Do they have different sides? Um, That's interesting. Um... Okay, so it looks like there might be an upgrade system or something, because one of those sides is clearly better than the other, so it'll be interesting to see how that plays out. And also, they mentioned, I, I'm not sure if I already mentioned this, but they include sleeves in the box for you to use uh, these. Of course, you're free to use whatever you want, but you might want to use uh, clear sleeves, because of course, double-sided cards, that's how it's going to work, so... I'm not going to comment too much on the weapons, because we got to know like the basic mechanics and stuff in order to like fully understand what's going on. Um, skill cards can also be ready, so these will have two sides, so like, uh, Varix, this, uh, Dragon Dude, you can spend, you can gain, a, um, put a fatigue on this, and during your or another hero's attack, doom the enemy. Now, doom, being doomed was a condition in sec, in, um, Journeys in the Dark, I don't remember what it was, so it sounds like this has something to do with conditions, so we'll see how that goes, and then Fate's Embrace, um, I'm not. I'm not even gonna get into what that uh, does because something about adding stars. I'm. I'm not sure what this does. Again, we don't know a whole lot about the mechanics, so we'll see what happens. But the readying mechanic as a way to kind of flip between weapons is definitely interesting. In fact, they're just bringing them, having them bring in the flipping aspect, to kind of shift your play style on the fly. Definitely is. Definitely is interesting. It's gonna help in terms of like you know getting gameplay to flow a little better rather than just being locked into a specific mindset for that quest. So that's my opinion on it. Um, so the app. So this is kind of like a key thing, difference between this and second edition. Of course, um, Journeys in the Dark did have Road to Legend, but again, like they said, that was more of an add-on compared to the main focus. Legends of the Dark, the app, is going to be the main focus. And it's fully built on it, which covers everything from activity, activating enemies, to building and unfolding scenarios, to opening the door for activities like crafting and shopping between quests. So there seems to be some sort of build it, like weapon building system. I'm not sure how that's going to work, if you can like kind of customize what stats go on a weapon, or if you like have to find specific resources in order to unlock specific weapons, and you like can't customize those weapons any further, but we'll see what happens. So... At the beginning of the quest, you'll perhaps start with only a single tile in play, but as you move deeper and begin to explore your surroundings, the app will play, direct you to place more tiles and terrain. 
The combination of double-sided map tiles and underlays gives unparalleled depth to the number of scenarios you can create, and the depth is elevated, no pun intended, with the, vertical, with the addition of vertical levels and 3D terrain that gives Legends of the Dark an unrivaled presence. So it's like what Road to Legend, where you can you start might start with one tile, but then it'll expand out and give you um, things that or kind of like keep you in the dark on certain things. So it's not like we haven't seen this before. This is definitely something they have done before. It's just now it's kind of like a core feature. So your levels will be filled with staircases up to other rooms, sturdy bookshelves, towering trees, treasure chests, barricades, doors, and statues. We've seen some of these in the, we saw some of those in the live stream. And this all isn't direct de de decorative, excuse me. You can interact with these. Um, so, like, you can look on a bookshelf, and depending on the character you have, you could find different things. You could climb a tree and snipe someone from up there, you know, hashtag sniper status. Um, you could do a variety of things. So, that could be, um, that's going to be interesting to see how that plays out. Just having that third dimension where basically, like, um, and this, I'm re referencing the climb, um, the aspect of climbing trees and going up to different floors. Having that third dimension just opens up some more tactical options in terms of like combat and moving around and stuff like that. So that's definitely a great addition. Um, so, okay, so it looks like we now have the monsters. So Uthuk Berserkers, uh, four whites, which look like skeletons. So we've seen Uthuk Berserkers perform um, Terranoth properties. Four zealots, these look like weak cultists. Uh, two fey, whatever those are. Um, I'm not sure, I actually can't tell what those are. Um, two specters, so these look like, you know, necromancer style, like ghoul or ghost things. Uh, four hybrid harbingers, these look like dragon hybrid things that look like warriors. Uthuk, Uthuk, or Uthuk, yeah, I think it's Uthuk, I don't remember. And I, and I pay attention to these closely. Four Uthuk blood witches, so more, um, Uthuk stuff. Two golems, um, looks like, look, they kind of look like the rune golems from Battle Lore and, um, Rune Wars, so it's gonna it's interesting to see them bring um, them to like the bad guy side for descent. Uh, four bandits, we've seen bandits before in descent. In fact, uh, um, I actually have the um, Manor of Ravens bandits that I need to paint right behind me, so there's that. Um, and then three wolves, so you just have wolves wandering around, and then the hybrid centurion, so. Kind of like how the Shadow Dragon was the big boss monster in 2nd edition uh, Journeys in the Dark, and the Crypt and Dragon was the big boss monster in 1st edition, the Hybrid Centurion is going to be the big boss monster for Legends in the Dark. Or Legends of the Dark. I, I, I'm, I'm mixing Journeys of the Dark and Legends of the Dark. Again, my brain is fried from all this excitement. So your objectives will change from quest to quest as you follow the overarching story of the campaign, but you'll con face constant opposition. From bandits to Uthuk berserkers, um, monstrous golems, wolves, whites. Um, every enemy is brought to life with miniatures, obviously. And these things are going to be an absolute blast to paint. Like, again, I like I am of the firm belief that unpainted miniatures should not be fielded ever. Like, even just a couple of colors on the model help because unpainted miniatures just look bland and lifeless. But once you put some paint on them, it just, it just. It just draws you in even more. Like that's the reason I've painted pretty much all my miniatures for all my games. Like I even painted my own Warhammer 40,000 relic miniatures. So uh, I know those really aren't designed to be painted, but I figured they just look better painted, and I was right. So there's that um, opinion. Uh, the Legends of the Dark app isn't limited to your quest. In fact, it opens the door for more opportunities between scenarios, such as crafting weapon, uh, such as crafting and weapon upgrades. Over the course, as you slay enemies, open chests, or explore rusty chambers, you'll uncover valuable crafting materials and gold, all tracked by the app. So that's nice, you won't have to write anything down, which I found with 2nd edition can be annoying at times. Once you've found the recipe for an item, you can craft and upgrade the item at, your, at the craft hall in your home city of Frostgate. Uh, we've heard that before, from, uh, that city name before from Road to Legend. Perhaps you'll create new Sears Blades or a Gilded War Bell. No matter what you craft, all weapons can be upgraded. Okay, so like I said earlier, what looks like weapons can be upgraded. Like we saw two different sides on the River Watch Spear, so that's fun. So as long as you have the resources to pay for it, unlocking an even more powerful version of the weapon is, is possible. So weapons can mod be modified even further in the armory. In Legends of the Dark, weapons have three parts. The first part dictates the weapon card that you use, but the other two parts grant your weapon secondary abilities with a percent chance of triggering each time your hero attacks. Okay, so there is a little bit of customization, it looks like. These bonuses are fully managed by the app and in the armory, and you can optimize for your next quest or customize your weapons to fit your style of play. That is good to see. So 
With second edition, you just had a vast array of weapons available to you, but there was no customization. And so once you bought that weapon, you were kind of stuck with it until you sell, sold it. And of course, you had the variety of heroes. Now there's less hero choices in Legends of, of the Dark, but there definitely are some more like weapon options that allow you to customize a bit further. So you aren't like dedicated or like locked into one dedicated playstyle. There is some room for branching out if you want to try some things or like gain like a like a minor buff in like a certain area that you're weak in. So there's that. Or you know just have a um, a weapon that kind of complement or like is a polar opposite to whatever weapon you really like, just for like situational purposes. I I may not be making sense, but this is how these videos go like they're very un they're unscripted they're kind of more loosely formatted uh that you can you complete to progress your hero's personal growth oh so these are like just like side quests for each individual hero and you'll let's see completing feats can grant you powerful rewards like new skills or exclusive recipes so you want to be sure you keep your feats in mind as you play your hero also earns xp over the course of the quest that can be used to unlock skills no surprise there your skills aren't fixed, however, at the start of the quest, you can choose which skills you want to take, reallocating your experience throughout the campaign as you learn, um, explore new play styles and learn more about how you want to play most. Okay, so it looks like you basically, you always, you have, like, as you gain XP, you keep that XP, you don't spend it, and then before each quest, you can essentially take a number of skills that have a combined XP value equal to or less than the amount of XP you've earned. At least that's the way I'm interpreting it. I could be completely wrong. But that's honestly a decent idea because like there are going to be some quests early game where you need one particular skill and then later game you need to swap out but you don't want to have to like... But if you don't want to... Um, if you haven't gotten a whole lot of XP, you can just swap out the skill that's useless and bring in the one that's useful. So that's definitely a good addition. Um, the story of Toll the Clock across the Blood and Flame campaign is an epic story that rises to its own finale, but at the same time, it's only the first act of your story. You can look for Act 2 and 3 to be coming in the future as their own expansions, each box packed full of new content, and the next full-length Legends of the Dark campaign. We don't have anything more to say about these upcoming Act expansions right now, but stay tuned in the following months for the release of the game. Second quarter, 2021 for Act 1. Okay, so... For the most part, I am excited. Like, getting more Descent Contact is amazing. There's one thing I am disappointed about, and that it's not a one versus many game. Like, that's kind of what drew me into Second Edition. But I'm not going to be judgmental right now. I want to play the game in order to, like, give my opinions on it because I don't want to just, like, I don't want to be one of those crab apples that's just like, oh, it's not what it previously was. I am not going to buy this piece of sh Like, that's personally not how I roll when it comes to this stuff. I want to get my hands on it myself and then test around with it before I make a solid opinion on it. So, like, maybe sometimes that will result in me wasting money, but with Descent, I don't really think it will because, honestly, like, this will have a place um, on my shelf. Like, there will be reasons for me to purchase this. That being said, there will also still be reasons for me to play Journeys in the Dark 2nd Edition. Like, it's not completely obsolete now that Legends of the Dark is a thing, but... Both fill their own unique niches, and I think that's what they were trying to go for here. So, in fact, I think that is what they were trying to go for. I think they said that on the live stream. So, I've been rambling about this for 23 minutes. I think tomorrow they're talking about the um, Prophet of Kings expansion. So, maybe that's what's next. Either that or some X-Wing talk. I don't know. But regardless, moving on to the next thing. Okay, so it turns out there wasn't a preview for Prophecy of Kings last Friday, and today there is no preview for uh, Django Fett Slave 1. Hopefully that comes tomorrow. But we do have the announcement for the Scarlet Witch pack for Champions. Now, this we kind again, like with Quicksilver, we saw this coming. They mentioned it um, offhand, I think, at... Um, was it like Gen Con, I think it was, where they mentioned it in an offhand comment? I'm not sure, but... In a couple of days, actually, actually next week, the Ant-Man pack releases, and then now we got this. So, good couple of weeks for um, for uh, champions. So, let's take a look at what we have here. So, standard hero pack. You got a 40-card deck. Uh, it's a Justice deck, so that's uh, interesting. And then you do have the um, additional um, extra cards that you get. So, uh, looking, um, starting off with Scarlet Witch and Wanda Maximoff, uh, 2 one two for the stat line in, uh, hero mode, 10 hit points, hand size of 5, and then in alter ego mode, you have 3 recovery and hand size of 6, 
pretty standard um, stuff for heroes. Definitely more of a thwarter and a defender than an attacker, but what is? And the recovery is kind of low comparatively, but eh, what can you do about it? So for the hero mode act or ability, uh, Chaos Control, interrupt when boost icons on an encounter card would be counted. Discard the top counter of the encounter deck and count the number of boost icons on that instead. Okay, so if you flip something with three boost icons, you can use this ability to um, to um, potentially reduce that down further, which boost icons are annoying as hell if you've played champions at all. So this is a really, really good ability. And it's not just when Scarlet Witch defends. Based on the wording, it's if anyone defends. You can only do it once per phase, but hey, it's better to have that and keep somebody alive, so... I'll take it. Uh, and then in terms of Alter Ego mode, uh, discard two cards from your hand. Draw two, draw three instead if um, Pietro Maximoff is in play. So I'm assuming that's the um, kind of the duality thing that we saw with, um, I think Ant-Man and Wasp had something like that. And um, I don't remember if Quicksilver had that. But if So basically, um, they, they've talked about this before where there are abilities that interact with each other. So like there's an Ant-Man and the Wasp card, I think, that interact with each other. And then this, if you have somebody else playing Quicksilver and they have, or they're in Alter Ego mode, you get this effect. But I'm not sure if there's going to be a, um, a um, Quicksilver ally that has that title. So we'll see what happens. So we've seen that. Now looking at the um, cards up here. So the three are uh, Hexbolt, Chaos Magic, and Warp Reality. We'll see if we'll get into those. So, yep, those are right here actually. So Hexbolt, uh, two cost event. Uh, comes with a um, chem resource. And I know that's not the official name, but it's just easier to say that. So... There's that. And also, it's my channel. As long as I'm not saying anything offensive, I'll say whatever I want. Uh, so, hero action. Discard the top three cards of the encounter deck. For each card discarded this way that has um, boost icons equal to zero, you deal two damage to an enemy. One, remove two threat from a scheme. Two, draw a card. Or three, place a status card on a character. Okay, so uh, you get to turn the um, encounter deck back on the, um, back on the villain. Now, there is an inherent risk in doing this in that you'll burn through it faster and you'll um, eventually end up with an acceleration token quicker, but as like a mid or late game play, this is fairly decent. Early game, maybe not so much just because, again, you're more likely to get that encounter, to um, to or not encounter token, acceleration token sooner, but mid or late game as a way to burn stuff. This is fairly decent because late game, you want as many cards as possible. You want to make um, late game, you're going to have a lot more threat on schemes, so that'll be handy. And especially if you're going up against Red Skull, who I haven't played against him yet. Uh, hopefully I get to do that here soon. But um, against Red Skull, he has that side scheme deck, apparently. I still don't know how that works, like I just said. And then you deal damage to an enemy. So a fairly decent uh, suite of options. Now, the 3 plus 1 isn't going to be too relevant, but when you get it, it's going to be handy. So that's fun. Uh, Chaos Magic. So... This is a zero-cost event with a wild icon. Uh, hero action, play a card from your hand, ignoring its resource cost. Discard cards from the top of the encounter deck equal to this card's printed re that card's printed resource cost. Okay, so I'm, not, I'm sensing a theme here with Scarlet Witch where she messes with the encounter deck. So she's a very high-risk, high-reward character from what I'm starting to get because, like I just said, discarding cards from the encounter deck like that is very risky and it'll likely boot you up with acceleration tokens much faster. But, as, like, again, mid or late game plays to try and burn the villain quicker, it is going to be really, really good. And, again, just being able to play any card, essentially, for free, that is amazing. Now, the question is, um, I think there's only two copies of this in the deck because... Or, wait, is there only one copy? There might only be one copy. Hmm, interesting. Because, uh, let's see here. So, this is card number one. I wonder what card number two is. I don't know. But how, let's hope there's multiple copies in the deck. Um, I'm not sure, though. We'll see what happens, though. Or in the set. Uh, then we have Warp Reality. It's a one-cost event with a fist resource. Hero Interrupt. When an encounter card is revealed from the encounter deck, cancel all of its effects and discard it. So, this is not when it's flipped for um, the villain attacking. It's when... Um, it's when, oh my god, why am I blanking? It's when, like, it's when, like, the, um, cards are dealt to the players. That's what the term is. It's been a while since I've played Champions, albeit there might be a video on that, uh, Wednesday after this video goes up. We'll see what happens with recording and my life getting in the way, but, uh, so cancel all of its effect and, effects and discard it. If you're in a pinch, that's extremely handy. Discard top cards from the top of the encounter deck equal to the number of boost icons on that card. So, this is going to be very dependent on the card that, um, 
is being flipped. There are some fairly decent one boost icon cards. Um, I am blanking on the names of them right now, but I know they exist. So in that that in those cases, this is a much more low risk play. But if you're going up against something like I think, is it Charge that has three icons or is that Armored Rhino suit? I don't remember. There's one Rhino card in particular that has three icons and it's annoying as hell. That this is a much higher risk play against that because you'll be discarding three cards from the encounter deck. And as I've already mentioned, that is a very risky play. But it, again, messing with the encounter deck. You're getting resources out of there that you're that the villain would be able to use, so there's that benefit. But again, acceleration tokens are things, so you got to be careful with that. Uh, slipping sanity is the obligation. You may flip to alter ego form. Choose either to exhaust and remove from the game. We've seen this before. Discard the top five cards in the encounter deck for each star icon in the boost area. Discard it this way. Place one threat on the main scheme. Okay, so. If I'm not mistaken, the stars on cert on cards are fairly limited depending on the villain. I think there are some that have more compared to others. Like, I think one of the Green Goblin encounters has quite a few. Um, the Ultron encounter might have a few. Um, I'm not sure. I'm not sure which villains have more than others, but it depends. On, the amount in the deck depends on the villain. So, some villains, this is going to be a much, actually, a much better play to, um, or much more, like, um, What's the word I'm looking for? It's not going to be as bad to do that bottom effect if you can't um, exhaust Wanda. But if you can't exhaust Wanda, obviously you should. But that other effect is actually not that bad. Against some villains, against others, it'll be horrendous just because of it. It will just shoot up the threat on the main scheme like there's no tomorrow. So, And also, it's a three boost icon card. So if you try to get rid of it with warp reality, just acceleration token, just know that. Uh, then we have speed. Um, this is a justice ally that's included in the um, in the set. So response after speed thwarts ready him limit once per round. He has four health, two thwart, one attack, one consequential damage on each. So what was there was? I'm pretty sure there was a. Um, I'm not sure if it was a hero. Oh, it's um, it's basically a miniature version of Quicksilver. That's what he is. So. If he thwarts, uh, you ready him. And Justice has always been about like removing threat and stuff like that, like Daredevil. And um, I think it was Under Surveillance. Those cards are really helpful in keeping threat levels down. Well, Under Surveillance is more just, you know, giving you a little more relay. But this, or leeway, relay, what the... F I, I don't know what I'm saying. <laughs> my, my mind is kind of fried right now. But speed, like, again, he gets to... Um, he gets to essentially thwart twice or thwart once an attack, so you have that bit of utility there if you need it. So that is really good. Uh, Crisis Inverted, it's a three cost event, and I should also mention I think speed cost four. Yeah, so you are going to be paying a hefty price for him, but you do get quite a bit out of him. Crisis Inverted, three cost with chem resource and uh, speed at a fist resource. Uh, as a hero action, remove six threat from the main scheme. Holy sh that's uh, that's potent. And if you paid for this card using a chem resource, this thwart ignores the crisis. Whoa, okay, that's, uh, that's potent. Um, yeah, I think six threat is the highest, like, base level threat removal we've seen on a card, so that's pretty good. But being able to ignore that crisis icon as well, like, I, you, I would expect seeing, like, ignoring the crisis icon on, like, a low threat removal card that removes, like, one or two threat. Not something that removes six. And if this this is a three cost, I thought if I saw this like and you didn't tell me what the cost was, I would have instantly assumed it was a four cost, maybe even a five cost. But a three cost, that is some incredible value right there. Now, of course, it is going to take a little more work to get out because you know three cost. But the sheer fact that it is a three cost makes it much more playable. If it was a four cost, I'd be a little more skeptical for it. Uh, then we have Swift Retribution and one cost event with a chem resource. Hero action, the villain schemes deal four damage to a villain. Okay, so if you're if the main scheme is low on threat, you can let the villain scheme and then you just punch it in the face. So that is fun. But if you're playing Justice, you have threat removal options. So that's really not the biggest thing in the world or the biggest um, problem in the world. Unless, of course, you're close to having the villain win the game or you're dealing with something like Ultron, which, yes, I still am salty about that. One day, me and John will go back in and kick his ass. We'll get there at some point. Um, so that's uh, Swift Retribution. Then we have Turn the Tide, uh, zero cost event, uh, response attack uh, with a bolt resource. After your um, hero thwarts and removes all threat from a scheme, deal to three damage to an enemy. Okay, so if you do manage to remove all threat from a scheme, you get to shoot an enemy for damage. So uh, 
And again, you're playing Justice. You have those threat, those threat removal options. So you're going to be removing a lot of threat. There you go. And of course, it naturally pairs well with Scarlet Witch because she is more of a thwarter than an attacker. So that is pretty good. Um, and then, of course, you have the game mat. And uh, yeah, um, watch for the Scarlet Hero Witch pack or Scarlet Witch Hero pack in in January. Okay, so. Yeah, so if I'm not mistaken, then, um, actually, let me go look at the release date for everything on the um, upcoming page, and I will be right back. Okay, so I'm actually here on the Champions product page, and while I was digging for that, I actually um, found a Wasi Plays video that apparent that um, told me a couple of things. Apparently, there has been some shifting of the release schedule, so Ant-Man is still coming out next week in November. There's That's still in set. But we're not getting in anything in December. So Wasp is apparently coming out in January. And then we're getting a double release in February with Quicksilver and Scarlet Witch. Albeit, I'm not too sure if that is accurate. Because if you paid attention to the bottom of this um, at your local retailer this January. So that could be a typo. So basically, no matter what, we're getting Scarlet Witch next year. That's uh, set in stone. But it's just a... Um, question of whether it's February or January and like I said the Wasi plays the video said um, That Quicksilver and Scarlet Witch are both coming in February, so We'll see if that holds true or not and it's not like they haven't done a double release of products before I mean they did a triple release in December last year when they released Captain America Miss Marvel and the Green Goblin pack all at the same time so there's that um, so we're getting those in February, and then of course we in um, they haven't announced it yet, but we're getting the um, Guardians of the Galaxy um, big box in March. It looks like so. Again, basically everything's still on track to be released by March. It's just they're not going to be releasing anything in December. Why I couldn't tell you, but again we're in a pandemic, so you kind of have to cut them some slack in that regard. But we're getting it at some point though in the near future. It's only like a what an extra month wait. Honestly, like, considering how long this thing has gone on, like, I can handle wait, waiting another month if it means, you know, being safe about it, you know, just making sure everything goes as planned. So, uh, yeah, that is going to do it for um, this part of it. I'm not sure if there's going to be the Slave 1 preview in this video or not, so if there is, it'll cut to it right now. Okay, so we have the last thing for X-Wing Wave 8, Django Fett Slave 1 now. This is definitely the thing I'm least excited for. Uh, the ETA 2 I was excited for because Cole and Eric were excited for it, and plus it's like literally one of the most iconic Republic ships, so why wouldn't you be excited for it? Because it's finally getting added at like, what, a year and a half after Republic was introduced? So uh, there's that. And then the V-Wing and the Tri-Fighter are personal favorites of mine, so I was really excited for those. But So the Slave 1... I mean, it's cool, but compared to all this other stuff, I just look at all that other stuff and I'm like, oh my god, yes. And then this is like, I mean, it's cool, but there's just all this other cool crap. So, uh, anyways, let's dive into this. I have dived into it a little, dove into it, good English, dived into it. I cannot speak. I've dove into this a little bit, but then the recording failed because my mic stopped working because technical issues are apparently a thing. So, yeah, so the dial, it's the same as the uh, Slave 1, as the Separatist, or not Separatist, uh, Scum Slave 1 dial, so there's that. Uh, Django Fett, we've seen him on, we saw this revealed on stream, I believe, so while you defend or perform a primary attack, if the difficulty of your revealed maneuver is less than that of the enemy ships, you may change a blank or a one enemy um, focus result to a blank result. Um, and also he's a PS6. And for those of you who are pulling a herp derp right now and forgetting what difficulty is, that's the color of your maneuver. So blue is the easiest, white's in the middle, red is the hardest. So if you have a blue remover, rem remover blue maneuver revealed on, um, on your slave one and your opponent has a red maneuver, you get this effect. So, I mean, it's okay. It's not spectacular, but Hey, changing a focus result to a blank result, I'm not going to complain. And plus, this thing only has like three red maneuvers, so if you're able to catch your opponent in a red maneuver situation while you don't have to with this, it, it can be beneficial, but the lack of blue maneuvers definitely hurts this a little bit because there's only five on this dial. So it's good, but it's not as good as one would think. So uh, then we have Boba Fett as a PS3. This I like a lot more. While you defend, if there are no other friendly ships at range 0 to 2, you may change one of your blank results to a focused result. This pairs well with Lone Wolf, assuming that this version of Boba can take an EPT. If he can, 
take Lone Wolf every time. If you can't, well, then that just sucks. So, I, and also on its own, like, just being able to have an extra focus result is always a good thing. So, there's that. And in terms of the stat line and action bar, it's the same as the Scum Fire Spray. Three primary, forward and back, two agility, six hole, four shield, with focus, target lock, red reinforce, and white boost. So, there's that. Then we have uh, Zamwasel, who, this is interesting. So, she has four charges. During setup, you lose two of those. And during the system phase, you can assign one of your secret conditions face down to yourself. So, assigning conditions to yourself is kind of new. And the two conditions are, you should thank me or you'd better mean business. So, the first of those is, obviously, you should thank me. Uh, you reveal this after you defend, it's assigned to you face down, and after you defend, Zam can recovers, or doesn't spend a charge, recovers a charge, then you can acquire a lock on the attacker, and I'm just going to say this right out of the way, or right out of the gate, HMPs, just HMPs with this. And then at the end of the engagement phase, if you did not defend at all, so this card is still face down, and you are in an enemy ship's firing arc, you can reveal this card and spend two charges, and then perform a bonus attack, so, uh, your opponent basically has to call your bluff on whether you put this face down or not, and whether they want a lock to get on them. Which, again, if you're playing with HMPs, that could be huge. But, um, and then if you, at the start of the system phase, if you, um, you automatically remove the condition, whether it's face up or face down. Now, in terms of you better mean business, let's see what this does. This is where uh, it glitched on me last time, so. Uh, this condition is signed face down, reveal it after you defend, we saw that with the last one. After you defend, you may spend two charges. If you do, perform a bonus attack against the attacker. Um, at the end of the engagement phase, if this card is in is um, face down and you are in an enemy ship's firing arc, you may reveal this card. If you do, Zam recovers two charges. So, your opponent essentially has... When you set one of your cards face down, you're either giving yourself a bonus attack if you take a shot, or you're requiring a lock. So... Basically, your opponent has to decide um, which one it is, so they might think you have, you better mean business and avoid attacking you, but then you have, you should thank me, and you get to pop them. Or they'll think you should, they'll, you'll have, you should thank me down, because you're trying to get locks for HMPs or something like that, but then you have, you better mean business, and you just light them up. So, some mind games happening right there, and I like it. So, that's, I'm actually starting to like this a lot more now. So that's fun. Uh, Separatist Racketeer, so this is just a generic PS2, nothing too fancy there. Uh, Django Fed is a crew member. Is it not going to load on me? Is it seriously not going to? Oh, there it goes. Uh, while you defend or perform an attack for this crew, uh, you may spend your lock on an enemy ship to change one of the enemy ship's focus results to a blank result. That, I think, is a lot better than the pilot's ability, just because you're generally going to have a lock. And again... If you're playing a list with HMPs, do it. Of course, this isn't only for Separatists. Scum can also take this, but not too sure what in Scum would pair well with this. So that I'll leave you to decide that one in the comments. So there's that. And then um, we have Zamwasel and uh, Boba Fett as a gunner. Uh, so the gunner version of Boba, Separatist or Scum. While you perform an attack, if there are no other ships in the attack arc, you may change one of your focus results to a hit result. Again, Lone Wolf pairing. So if your ship can take an EPT and a gunner, there's a combo for you. Um, and then Zam, uh, during setup, you lose your charges. There's two of them non-recurring. During the system phase, you get one of those two conditions we talked about. So you can put those conditions on basically any ship. What you'd want to put on them on Separatists aside from the Fire Spray, I mean, the only thing you could put it on is, um, is um, what is it, the um, Sith Infiltrator and... Actually, now that I think about it, I think the um, HMP has a crew slot. Actually, let me look that one up quickly. I'll be right back. Okay, so I just looked. It turns out every HMP except for the uh, Geonosian prototype has the crew slots. You could totally put Zam on an HMP and get target locks that way. So that's actually kind of a fun combo. So, it, I mean, I, honestly, at this point, I'm starting to wonder if they designed both of the Separatist ships in Wave 8 with um, HMPs in mind. I mean... There's also, and then again, there's also Tarkin, like I talked about earlier in this video, where if you're playing cross-faction, that would be fun, but that's not something everybody's going to be doing, and so we're mainly focusing on the Separatist things here. So we saw Zam, um, Hondo, we've seen this, I think, uh, action, he doesn't have a faction restriction, so you can put him with whoever. Choose two ships at range one to three of you that are friendly to each other. Um, coordinate one of those ships, then jam the other, ignoring range restrictions. So... 
in terms of um in terms of the um I I'm trying to find the words to describe this like there are ships that are going to be able to take advantage of this like if you have a ship with um I think it's perceptive co-pilot that naturally will get two of focus tokens you could jam that one clear that and then coordinate a ship who needs another action uh, in terms of using this on enemy ships the jam action the jamming is good the coordinate I'm not too sure what exactly um I'm not too not too sure how exactly the well or what you can do to kind of screw your opponent over um since I actually now that I think about it since coordinating technically causes the ship to perform an action if they have a stress token they can't um, they can't perform the action. Correct me if I'm wrong on that one, but I think that's how it works. The coordinate part of this on an enemy ship, I'm not too sure how well that's going to work. But the jam you can work around with friendly ships. The coordinate works well for friendly ships, and or at least friendly to the side that has Hondo. And then the jam for enemy ships is, is pretty good. So three out of the four things it does are decent. The fourth one we got to figure out. So, uh... Slave 1, uh, Separatists or Scum, Fire Spray, um, makes sense. While you perform a forward arc primary attack, if you are in the Defender's Aft section, you may change a hit result to a crit result, and you add a gunner slot. Okay, so the Fire Spray still does not innately have a gunner slot, it looks like. So, you have to take this in order to get it, but if you're behind an enemy, you get an extra crit result, I guess. So, uh... Or you get a crit as a replacement to a hit, so that's decent, I guess. Hopefully it isn't, doesn't cost too much because of the gunner slot, otherwise this might not be too good because, like, it's it's just upgrading a hit instead of adding one, essentially, so there's that. Uh, Boba Fett, we uh, saw that. And then Weapon System Officer, I don't think... I think this is a new one, so a new gunner. After you perform a special attack with the target lock requirement, you may acquire a lock on the defender... Uh, so when it says special attack, just like secondary weapons, so like torpedoes can and stuff like that. So if it has the lock requirement, you may acquire a lock in the Defender. Once again, HMPs. Through, actually, so now that I think about it, you take a, a cheap Slave 1, you just take a Separatist Racketeer with um, Slave 1, and then throw a Weapon System Officer on it. You have a way to, and then throw like torpedoes on it or something. You have that now. Um, so there's that. False transponder codes, it's an illicit with one charge. After you acquire a lock on an object or an object acquires a lock on you, if you have one active charge, lose one charge and jam that object, ignoring ranged restrictions. Okay, so... I'm honestly not too sure about this one. It's only one charge, so... It already has a little less value than, one, than you might hope, and you're jamming them, which isn't necessarily the best in all situations honestly i'm i'm not sold on this one like it's very rarely that i say a card outright sucks i feel like this is in that territory like with jamming beam like i'm sorry but i i genuinely do not understand this card at all so yeah um so besides that though this is actually looking fairly decent um Actually, what's going to make this um, weapon system officer great is if there's a cannon that requires a target lock action. If that comes out, oh boy, that with HMPs is going to be nuts. But for now, you're going to have to make use of torpedoes or missiles or something like that. So there's that. Um, actually, now that I think about it, you what you could do is if the um, fire spray has a torpedo slot, which I'm not too sure if this one does or doesn't, you put a crew member on there that has the calculate action, which I'm not sure what um, separatist crew there is that gives you calculate. But then you take energy shell charges, and then you can reload that. And that I think has the um, e wait. Does I not actually? I'm not sure if that has the target lock or the calculate um, requirement. And eh, I'll put it up on screen, and uh, you'll know if what I said there makes sense or not. So. Uh, overall, this is actually some fairly decent stuff. The upgrades are a little underwhelming, but the, except for Zam, because uh, Zam is actually seems pretty good. But the pilots are pretty interesting, especially Boba and Zam. Like, those are the two that I'm looking forward to the most. Again, I'm not looking forward to this as much as the other three expansions, especially the Tri-Fighter and the V-Wing. But there's still some pretty decent stuff in here. So, uh, yeah, assuming there is no other... Actually, if there is other news, we'll go ahead and skip to that now. 
And if there's not, we're obviously still here. So hopefully you enjoyed what you saw here today. Again, sorry this can get incoherent at times, but I kind of have to keep it loosely edited like this in order to um, make sure I can actually get it out on time along with the other videos that I upload and also keep my personal life in check. So you kind of are going to have to put up with it if you, um, you want to watch these because it's kind of just an innate thing that I have to do. So... I'm mean, anyways, I'm going to shut up before I start rambling. So uh, yeah, that will do it for this video. Peace out, y'all.